So you know what's going to suck, Liz, is that that music is going to be going away next episode. Why is that going to suck? We're going to replace it with something else? And because we? people don't know that we just do the Peanuts dance while we listen to that. Well, yes, I will miss doing the Peanuts dance. Like you're just kind of doing your like I was. head to I'm the side the, to side and I'm just kind of doing like the lioness or whatever, yeah. my face down and my legs akimbo. Yeah. Woo! find you know something else cool to do though it'll be all right i guess are we still literally gonna skank for the entire beginning episode of the new song actually you know what i totally did i think uh the last time i heard it now that i think about it okay i was i was with the elbows bent knees bent okay well yeah. for the last time how is everybody doing welcome to sounds like liberty i am your host nikki p you're my lovely wife and co-host lizzie hello don't panic y'all it's only for the last time as it sounds like liberty because next week it's official we're gonna become peace freak yep and we will be right back here next week as peace freaks with uh with a little bit of a different uh, thing going on with the show i mean mostly just a different name but you know that's, that's something yeah, important. just a little bit. We are still here kicking it with the Launchpad Media, where we are always launching ideas in your direction. Indeedy. And uh, we've got a fun episode laid out for you today. But be, uh, before we get into that, let's uh, let's talk about uh, some good podcasting out there. Yes, let's. You, uh, you want to know what's going on in the world, don't you, Liz? I do. And you know what you need to do? What's that? You need to go find Mr. Kyle Anzalone and Foreign Policy Focus. Why, that's a great idea. Because he's just putting out that good foreign policy info. You know, and he's like tight with Scott Horton and all that stuff, so you know it's the good foreign policy, not the kind that made us change our podcast name. Yeah, and I mean, let's face it, this is stuff that we need to be kind of knowledgeable about so so i've got most things changed over for the podcast uh the only thing i haven't been able to get changed over is facebook won't let me change the page name mm, big shock facebook is making you jump through hoops to do something lots of them and I, there's still no guarantees they ever actually going to do it yeah so there you go you know something about they think i'm just changing every, what everything is on people who like the page and like look motherfuckers i'm changing my podcast name and that's what's changing they think you're trying to pull a pull a past one, pull a fast one. So they're asking me for like, um, what do they call it? Oh, do you have a press release on it? I'm like, what the fuck do you think I am? Like, I got like 700 Facebook friends and like not that many fucking listeners. Like, what kind of press release am I doing? What press gives two shits about our podcast? It makes it more official, I guess. <sighs> I guess. Um, they're not the only people who've gone through it. Uh, the guys over at Portman Show. Formerly uh, Puke and the Gang. Uh, they had to go through it with for theirs. And they, they eventually got it done. That 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 name just makes me giggle every time I hear it. Portman Show. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, it's like a name that is itself. Right. Exactly. It's delightful in that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty down with that. And that's actually Brett Vinat and James Schmiel and oh, what's this? This is other buddy that I like. Mm. Um, I'm not. I'm not so hot with names. That oh, particular this group is, of this guys. Is actually, this is actually going to bug me because mm. they they do the uh, discomfort zone together. Andrew Mercer. Ah, okay. They're fun guys. Um, they're kind of way too into that podcast. Like where daddy issues or call me daddy. I think it's called. Say what now? Don't go research that, people. It's terrible. Is that the one with the two chicks? Ah. Uh, Maybe. It's not guys we fucked, but it sounds pretty similar to that. Okay. Yeah, that does not sound like a thing I am into. I am actually on a total tear with the uh, What I Wore When or something like that. It's it's put out by Glamour, which I generally would avoid, but man, do I like that show. I don't know why. It's put out by Glamour, which means I know, I know. Crappy. But they just they had just posted an episode where she's talking to Sutton Foster about, you know, her fashion, and I, I loved every single second of that. And, and see, here's the beautiful thing, folks. I don't know what the fuck she's talking about <laughs> either. She's over there going on about people. I'm like, yeah, 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 cool. What kind of wars did they start? Yeah, it's not it's not to do with anything. You actually did have a cool thing you pulled up the other day. I did, I did. I, uh, in my uh, fashion history group, someone pulled up the, the story of when... A, uh, a wheat feed uh, manufacturer actually started making uh, pretty bags to put their feed in to send out into the Dust Bowl in the uh, into 1930s during the Great Depression so that people, when they were done feeding their chickens or whatever, could take those uh, those packages and make dresses or kids' clothes or whatever they needed that's to make out of it. That's what we call added value, folks. Yeah, that's definitely a, a part of the capitalism as, as I understand it. Pretty Not much. as they, they try to tell you what it is. That's uh, Well, it's like how do you give people the same product but make it more valuable to them? Right. 
and that's what they did. And actually, I, I found a cool uh, article. If you if you do some googling, maybe I'll throw something in the show notes. But yeah, there's there's all sorts of stuff. They they had like kids uh, stuffy patterns on it after a while, and stuff it was really interesting. That actually is pretty interesting. Yeah, until of course World War Two when they started rationing the uh, the cotton, and then everything had to be made out of paper. Dang wars. Yeah, and that's just another way the government steals your fucking money, folks. You know, you could have been getting your feed and your dresses all in one thing, and they got to go and steal that shit. And you don't want to put your daughter out there in a paper dress, right? Yeah, no, it does not work in the rain. It's very... With all those rough people back in the fucking Dark Ages that was like the... <laughs> dark Ages. The fucking World War <laughs> okay. I. That was that was the turn of the century. It's not exactly the dark ages. They had automobiles and the phone. Did they have and inter- electricity? Did they have internet porn, Liz? No, it's no, the they fucking did not. dark ages then. Although, well, you know, never mind. I'm just gonna let that. You're just gonna talk about actual prostitutes? No, no. Actually, they did have porn back then. I, I, there, there. It exists. It still exists. Anyway. Okay. Moving well, right I'm, along. I'm all about the history of pornography, so if you got, you know, you got links, we can put those in the show notes. I'll yeah, check we're not putting it. those check in the show notes. That is not happening. It's definitely happening now, folks. I'm you gonna are going to have to Google sure. that on your own, and uh, you know, you, I'm not smart enough to Google that. that however, however, most of however you remember. do that. All right, uh, so you know, hopefully, I've, I've talked about this with you a little bit. So there are some changes that are going to, I think, hopefully come up in the next uh, you know, when we actually. Move forward next week with the show. I need people to hold me to this, but I really want to do some like skits and fun songs for the show. Oh, yeah, I want more production value. I see. I wanna, I wanna go big, go big or go home. We'll say. Um, so you know that's something I want to do. We've got already got like some some of the interviews we're gonna have under the belt. Our, our first interview is actually going to be Jordan Johnson yeah. from the Veterans for Altruism, and <sighs> it's refreshing to have a conversation with a. Another old school punk rock guy. That is, that was a very cool part of that conversation. Yes, I enjoyed that part of the conversation. It's like, hey man, remember these bands and like these shows and stuff? I was like, yeah man, I remember those bands and those shows. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so, all right, well, I think we will labor this enough. Obviously, yeah. go to support SLL. You can join the Freedom Choir. I'm gonna have to, uh, you know, come up with some new naming conventions because yeah, you know how we do. Yeah, things are changing. N- names are changing, and this means URLs are changing and. I think it's going to be better, though. Absolutely. I think I, one of the things, I, let's talk more about some stuff and stuff. So that's, yeah. that's a key. Just just take the ride with us. It'll be good. Mm, she's, she's a good ride, folks. I'll tell you that. Uh, really? Um, so let's listen to this song and then get into this interview with the wonderful, as you saw in the uh, thumbnail, Monica Perez. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to Sounds Like Hi. Lady, Miss Monica Perez. How are we doing today? Super fantastic. How are you? You know, I'm I'm hopefully going to get a new job after I get off the phone with you, and that's going to be better, hopefully. Yeah. yeah, that's always a good thing. Those, that's the stuff that's most important, daily life. It is. And, you know, it's a weird, a weird thing to deal with daily life when... You know, you see the world around you crumbling in every imaginable way. <laughs> Dude, I can't sleep at night. And I try to think, like, I is this really going to affect me? Like, I really care about my family. I want to make sure nobody's hurt. And, like, can I not care that people are killing other people in my name with my money? Am I allowed to not care about that? Well, so here in my own personal thing, like, I have gone through phases when I was into politics and phases where I wasn't into politics. Um, I remember emptying my entire kitchen into my backyard in college when George Bush won over Kerry. And then I kind of- You just like were t- t- had a temper tantrum? I was very prone to temper tantrums as a <laughs> as a young 20-something and okay. literally ripped every drawer in my kitchen and every dish out of the walls and threw them into the backyard. Was this was this bodybuilder, Nick? Just, just so this I know. Was, this was spending way too much time on uh, supplements. No, oh, okay, yes. okay, yeah. So, wow, interesting. <laughs> the plot thickens, right? Yeah. I was perhaps a little wound tight at that point. And then I kind of mm-hmm. got out of it. 
because it didn't, you know, ultimately it really didn't seem to make that much difference in my life other than. Yeah, because the wrong Bonesman one, you couldn't, you couldn't handle that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, this is, so I was a green party kind of person at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Like I, I would have always classified myself as an anarchist. I've always hated authority, but I kind of, I guess, would have thought of myself as a lefty because they at least gave lip service back then to the whole war. Mm -hmm. But that can't. The whole war being against war, is that what you said? And, and remember, I'm also in my early 20s and not all that wise enough to have seen how much hypocrisy and bullshit that even at that point in time they'd exhibited. I was still young. But the left, the left anarchy thing d never made sense to me because who's owning the property? You know, I, the, this is the, this is completely a gut instinct thing, and this is not a having read or even probably really thought about things. I just knew I hated authority. Right, right. And perhaps had some kumbaya ideal that I, I envisioned. Um, eventually, you know, many years later, I discovered Tom Woods and kind of got set straight on all that. <laughs> Although I would I still... can relate to that, though. The knee-jerk, no authority. But, I totally get that. But when it all really changed for me and when I became interested in politics again is when I had a kid. And moreover, when I had a black daughter and I'm watching all of the racial tension in the world around us just fucking go insane. Just get cranked up to 11. Yeah, right. like... And people exploiting, like, in the name of trying to solve it, making it worse. Right. Yes. So much worse. Like, we we watched the documentary that I've, I've just been freaking out about. It's called uh, Pick It Up, and it's about ska music in the 90s, which is all, like, the real big fish and less than Jake kind of stuff. And I literally cried at the end of it because I remember how, like, how kind of kumbaya about race we all were back then. And then I, I really think back to like, when I was a kid... Like, we genuinely were in a uh, post-racial <laughs> society kind yeah. of thing. Like, and then I I'm watching this video and, like, seeing how important it was to the culture, which was at the time kind of a dominant, like, youth culture. And then I think about where all those kids are now and, like, how amped up on race everyone is. And it's just like, this is not well, something that like happens on, as... like, happens naturally. This is forced in some way. Yes, and I feel like as the ideology has converged to what I peg the liberal fascist center the when I lived in Palo Alto, San Francisco. And I was like, wait, we can't have porn or pot. And we also have war. Like you guys can all agree on that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, there's the liberal fascist center. And as, as the parties converged on that, they needed something that would divide us. I think that you couldn't resolve. Yeah. So they decided that identity would be something. I mean, obviously, it goes back to the Frankfurt School and all that. Yeah, I was going to say, I know, no, that goes back way further. They, they, they've been working yeah, on no, that. Yeah, no, I know, but, but I'm it, just saying it's inversely, it's like a zero sum game. You yeah. can have ideological conflict. And as that receded, identity conflict had to take its place because you, like in a two party system, it really has to be all about conflict, even if the governmental elements of ideology are really in this weird harmony where they, uh, the overlords all kind of agree. Right. That otherwise you would have an us and them, us and them thing of us versus them. Right. So they needed to redefine us and them. Well, that's why it's, I mean, it's why Bernie could never win because Bernie's still too bought into the old school class thing. And they don't want people to pay attention to class. They want people to pay attention to something that can't be resolved in any way, which race, sexuality, identity, those things are unresolvable because they're innate and you can't do anything about them. Yeah, I and, think that's where it comes from. And it's super frustrating. Um, it's more frustrating to me because like, I, I know I I have done some study in phenomenology, which is basically, I think, the precursor essentially uh, to, it's a philosophical precursor to postmodernism that they call it now. It's all your... Um, uh, <laughs> all your I'm not much of a student of philosophy, but boy, do I love to get these kind of tidbits well, like customized. So, what is it? What's phenomenology? Uh, it's it's Sartre. It, um, who are all the big ones that like I, I can't even remember them all off the top of my head anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but like they, like, I, what I do remember is like it's like Sartre and Hegel and like stuff like that would have all been kind of in the school. All the Frankfurt School guys would be collapsed into this. Mm -hmm. Um, but the big thing is. <sighs> The way that, like, it's taught now kind of doesn't make sense to, like, what it actually was philosophically at that point in time, what the actual takeaways were. Mm -hmm. And they kind of weaponized this, like, genuinely pretty, like, nothing science yeah. into something that's completely insane the way that it's it's taught now. Um, I, I, I always go back to, I love when Michael Malice and uh, Thaddeus Russell got into it on Michael Malice's show and Thad's like, well, then, you know, nothing can nothing's real. 
And Mike's just like, well, no, just because you can't see it or perceive real doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Like, and that's all this, this stuff says. But that gets... It's I go I go I go off on this one. It's it's too soapboxy. Well, again, I'm such a concrete thinker that like my favorite ology is Mises praxeology. It's like none gotcha. of that matters. Just what matters is what actually happens. What do people do? Yeah, well, yeah. Like I just I'm so I'm almost two dimensional. I'm so three dimensional. It's weird. Like I I can <laughs> I get that there's like however many dimensions. I don't know the true nature of power in the universe. Ooh. I probably don't even know it here on Earth. But when people say, well, economics can't, doesn't really work. It's not everybody isn't rational. It's like, it doesn't matter if they're rational. Let's just talk about what actually happens yeah. and stick with that. And you, whether it, whether this table is real or not, it doesn't really even matter. I just, it's, we have to act like it's real or you're going to keep hurting ourselves. Well, and that's, and that's kind of the, the big thing that they, the, the people who teach like the whole postmodernist thing don't, don't teach is that mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Like, so what phenomenology postmodernism actually teaches you is that so just because we live in this world and there's a physical world and all these things encapsulate it we all experience it different like because we have different lives we have different like i can't even tell you that your rods and cones in your eyes interpret like the same yes 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 is red green right. to you my red is your green yeah yeah we right. don't know and the fact is is that we can't we can't know right. and so can't know. you have to fundamentally understand that that is always a possibility and so communication in and of itself is flawed that's that's the core tenet that's everything i have a i have a son who has down syndrome and i honestly wonder if sometimes like his world is just like tripping yeah if he's really like <laughs> tripping balls all the time like i just wonder if he sees through a kaleidoscope like he just I mean, so I, I, I firsthand see what it's like to talk to somebody whose reality is totally different. Mm. I don't know. I that. interrupted such a good flow. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, the, the, it's always amusing to me because it's like, I've actually heard, you know, some people discuss, well, I mean, technically it's possible like that extra chromosome is the, the next step in human evolution. And that's why they're capable of kind of relating the world. And from what I understand is a much more, um, positive way like they're more apt to take things as they are i don't know but that's the way it's always been kind of relayed to me they're more well, it does he does seem to strip away i always get this wrong i don't know what what's the right words for it but like that is the super ego whatever the, whatever it is that makes you care about what other think other people think of you mm. which whether you are consciously aware of it or not like it definitely is like what you were saying about you yeah. just don't know other people's experience like that's all part of the experience and they do exploit that in my opinion when they're talking about race and stuff they act like everybody doesn't have these insecurities you know, they're worse for some people than others but this kid actually doesn't have them he just loves yeah. people. He just goes up and like hugs you. He will hug a pit bull. I'm Aww. not kidding. Like it's not, it's not, yeah, it's, it's worked out okay so far. <laughs> but you know, obviously there are some reasons to have those barriers up. Yeah. But he doesn't have them. And in that regard, I think it is, it's kind of like uh, my dog. Like there, she just loves you for, for you. Like she doesn't care at all. Like you could, she cannot see the wrong. And I think I, my husband thinks that's like the ultimate kind of love, the ultimate spiritual achievement. But think of all the abstract thinking that you have to peel away sure. to, to get there and that all that stuff has purposes. Well, and that's, and that's kind of always been one of my, my things as a person. I'm kind of over here like it, it seems blissful in its own right, but I don't know that I would ever give up anything that makes me me. And it's, it's why I'm, I have my issues with like psychotherapy and things like that. It's like I don't want anybody messing around up there. Like yes. all, all those crossed wires are what makes me who I am. <laughs> And you start messing yeah, around with too point. many of them. Like, who am I then? And then, like, I, I'm too old to go through a <laughs> go through rewriting yeah, my well, personality. Well, I think you know, I'm always down the rabbit hole. So for me, I think that they they actually are a lot closer to understanding how all that stuff works. Mm. And they're so good at manipulating. I, I feel like psychology and sociology were put in place so that we couldn't connect to replace praxeology. So you couldn't yeah. just connect the dots of like, this is what's happening pretty clear that's how people react they're like no you think that but there's all this other stuff in society and in the psyche that makes them not just act rationally and i feel like that it's deliberately like 
pushes us in the wrong direction, but that the answers, I think they actually did a lot of psychological experimentation in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. I thought it it was the Nazis that did it. Well, I think they did physical experiments, but like in the 60s and stuff, I think the Russians were doing it and we we were, or we were doing it saying they were doing it and that we have to do it because they're doing it or whatever. But I feel, I feel like they discovered a lot more than they're, than they've they would ever tell us because they use it against them. What's, sure. what's, what's that that you always say in the proper poor that they're always 10 years ahead of where they think they are? Or yeah, they at are? least. Yeah. At least. So what? what is, what are they up to and that they can control Nothing us? Nothing good. That's all I know. The, the mind. But the upside is they care so much about what we think. They have such complete stranglehold on the media and, and like the su- censorship and suppression and surveillance. They care so much about what we think. I'm thinking maybe Maybe that's all that really matters, which is a pretty weak position of theirs. Yeah. And you've got to really renew your efforts to control people's minds constantly. You can't just win that battle once and for all. Um. Well, I think in that in that way, you're taking away the fact that there a lot of the mind control stuff is built up uh, culturally. I mean, it's when you like, look at the way North Korea does it. Any any of the big regimes have always it's all about self policing. They have people within the within the community are the ones that actually help keep everybody in line. Since everyone can be a, a spy, everyone can be a plant. Like it just keeps you psychologically doing playing the game that you need to play. And yeah, over time, and then they, that becomes normal. And they put you in the digital cage of the mind through social media and all that. And if it that is actually my greatest fear is that if you look back on history. Sure. There's been tyranny and oppression and dictatorship and totalitarianism and the struggle for that. People have always wanted to do that. But this is the first time, I think, that that they're going to have 5G on their side, you know, or they're they're going to have that constant surveillance. So this is this ought to be an interesting question. See, I, full disclosure, I often wonder: Is Monica on the level? And the reason I have to wonder that is because how in the world does she manage to yep. be an openly anarcho-capitalist person on the radio? And I already assume that one in four people I know via the internet are <laughs> some sort are, of fed. Yeah, they're a spook of some kind. Not actual people. Yes, I assume. <laughs> or the same person. I, or like they're all fake. That's you know that's my theory about Google we, is that they're creating entire communities of no one but you. Yeah. We we had a friend. Uh, uh, an online friend. I've, we've had him on the podcast before, and so, like all uh, somewhere in late October, he just disappeared. Stopped doing his podcast. His Facebook page no longer exists. Really? Can you say who it is? Uh, I'd rather not. No, all right, <laughs> just in case. Wow. Yeah, just in case. But I'm like, yeah, you yeah. know, is he a real person? Is he a spook? Like, I mean, we know that they do that. Like, we've we've watched enough retarded kids go and try and blow up bridges with the shit they got from the FBI agents that were handling right. them. That like, right, right, everything is suspect. And I assume that at least one in four people I know are. Maybe it's more. Well, my, for me, the, yeah, the WSB thing is weird. I wasn't looking for it. They came to me and, uh, and I'm only on the weekends. It's like my eighth, ninth year. There's nothing, the the weekends doesn't move the dial. And I'll give you an example. Hmm. I, I can, I'll have people on and talk about legislation. I want to help resist for Georgia. It doesn't matter. Like if, if it just makes very little difference. One time I filled in for Eric Erickson, who's on during the week and no knock raids were coming down the legislature and they were, nobody was talking about it. And I had an activist on my show on the, this fill in, or at least I knew about it, was talking about it. And we stopped that law. Hmm. So the difference between that's why if I'm ever on prime time, I wonder if they will start like curbing what I say. I don't know. But for me, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Like some people think Ron Paul is a limited hangout. 
Some people think that. But <laughs> but does it matter if so? And then you could also say Alex Jones is a limit hanger. I think Alex Jones is ridiculous. I, I think he's clearly <laughs> there to discredit the things that he says. Hmm. But if it you have discernment, yeah, if you have discernment, you can take the true things that he says, which are required in the limited hangout for people to be able to actually buy into it. If you have discernment, you can take the true things and leave the other stuff. It's like when Putin acted like he took Edward Snowden seriously. Hmm. So I think Edward Snowden is a CIA agent. So why wouldn't Putin out him? I don't even think he was in that airport in Moscow way back when, when like the whole press corps of the world was waiting for him and there was like one men's room in the whole place and they were there for 45 days. Like, I don't believe that guy was there. Yeah. So Putin <laughs> could have outed him, right? But why, but wouldn't, doesn't it make more sense for Putin? Same thing with ISIS. He could out ISIS as being a creation of us or our allies or whatever. So instead he says, oh yeah, I'm going to use ISIS for my purposes, or I'm going to use what Edward Snowden is saying about the surveillance state in the United States and emphasize that it's bad and the people should be disgruntled about it. So for me, you just have to have discernment. And, and that's why all I ever say is don't believe anything just defend the bill of rights why why is that why is that now a thing on the right and not on the left like who doesn't want that i don't know that i think it's on the right or the left anymore i don't think anyone yeah yeah no i, don't I agree think anyone I agree. cares yeah yeah you're right you're right and and trump did that yeah. trump did that like obama oh my God. had done it and now trump did it you're looking at, i'm looking at the fights going on right now like over Trump and like what what they're legally allowed to do and you're just like no one cares anything about what the Bill of Rights has to say take them all right and that is my problem with the Trump supporters and I try to reach them on my show and that's the funny thing I do I get abused from both sides because I'm not a Trump supporter so I was I held Obama and Trump to the same standards and and people show that they're really not capable of of sticking to their ideology when they think it's just this two-party system, just winners and losers. I'm kind of curious. Uh, I know I've been listening to a lot more Free Talk Live lately. Not, I don't listen to it every day, but I listen to it enough. Um, and man, the number of like white supremacists or, you know, race race realists that are calling into that show a lot. is pretty startling. I'm curious if you have to deal with any of that or they get screened out pretty good for you at the well, uh, station. I used to never, ever screen. Like my rule, unlike everybody else's rule at that radio station, my rule was if they're so inebriated as to be unintelligible, then I can't take them on the air. But uh, people used to screen out Ron Paul supporters all the time. Hmm. These are Republicans. And I would say those are the ones I would look for. And I, I could tolerate anything because I can handle anything. I can even handle trolls. I like the trolls because they call and they say something that doesn't really make sense if you if you're focused on what they're saying and they and they look like idiots because they can't, they're reading off a script and they can, so I like the trolls. But what started happening at the same time that I think the internet closed and I called it on February 14th, 2018. Mm. I didn't know that I would be next and I was purged more or less. Like they took my WordPress site down and I've really never recovered, but, and they started striking me on YouTube and I just gave up on it because I didn't want to lose. Well, if it makes you feel any better, YouTube is now useless to everybody. Yeah. Well, I changed my YouTube channel to a cocktail <laughs> video blog. So because I had a thousand subscribers, I'm like, let me make something useful out of it. But so what happened back then, they turned, they basically closed down the internet and they, and uh, I noticed it because I just couldn't do the kind of research I had done like the day before. And at that time, so they can't really take me off of WSB, like the way they can just ding you off of whatever uh, social media. But what, what started happening then is I started getting trolls who would say really offensive things, like especially anti-Semitic things. Uh -huh. So they convert any kind. I, I don't get into that. There are few topics that I feel are useless to get into. 9-11, abortion, Israel are just things that people get very emotional about. And if I'm going to fall on my sword for something, I'm going to really, you know, that's going to be it. But then you you eliminate half the population of your listeners if you take a side on those issues that they don't want to hear. Yeah. But I feel like what they were trying to do was discredit me by saying horrible things because they know I'm anti-war by saying horrible things that I would then be responsible for because I allowed somebody to say it on my show. And yeah. then I started looking into it and there were articles written like this guy let this, this is what was said on this guy's show. Right. Okay. They're setting me up. 
So at that point, uh, they started to, I let the screener screen and that, and they, I, I don't know what they screen out, but I get fewer calls because the screeners then will be a little more scrupulous, which I would always be like, give me whoever. But if they're going to say, and there was another thing like the Pope drinks baby's blood, <laughs> which he might, I don't know, but I mean, how would you know? It how gets would you a little it? crazy. Right, yeah. Right. And then it gets, and then even if I'm like, well, how do you know that? Then they start saying like, you know, they say such offensive things, they slip them in. Right. That you got to wonder if they're trying to set you up in a way that's just offensive or like an FCC violation that they could charge $50,000 or whatever for. Yeah. And you start costing the station money. You're, you're, oh, yeah. Oh, they that would do, be They can't it. do anything. I mean, and, they, and who knows? Maybe that's maybe that maybe they're in deeper than they want to be. I don't know. You know, like maybe the station would like that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. They, they don't screen what I say, but I try to not say things that would get anybody really in trouble. I try not to be offensive. I try to just be logical. Hmm. I think, well, I think you, you're in an, a nice place and that you, ca- you kind of get so off into the weeds that I think you have plausible deniability, um, which I think is kind of what honestly saved Jones as long as he could. It, Jones, I think, would still be doing it if it wasn't for the whole, um, them moving him into the whole Sandy Hook thing. Uh, well, like, but they, but don't you think they did that on purpose? Isn't Sandy? Oh, oh no, I'm not. I'm not saying they didn't. But I'm yeah. saying if you go by the struck, like he, everything he said was just kind of so out there that no one could, no one would take it seriously. And, but they took me off. They destroyed my whole, all my work because of a Sandy Hook thing that I didn't, I didn't say it was a hoax. I just put a picture up that they said was a copyright violation, and they took. Well, that's how everything entire... is. Everything's copyright violation. Yeah. <laughs> but they should have just taken the picture down. They told me not to take the picture down. They're like, "We're going to fight for you," so I didn't take it I down. Just... And then they took down everything. Oh yeah, I mean, it's that's that not, one doesn't surprise me in the least. Um, you got to remember, like these are people that don't want to do any work or any effort, and it's way easier to just kind of make the problem go away than spend man hours dealing with it. I guess. <laughs> Um, what do you mean? Well, I mean, if you were going, to, if they were going to prolong it and actually have to work for you, then that means somebody's going to have to be paid to do that. And yeah, maybe maybe your site's not big enough. They care. Were you making them a lot in advertising? I don't really understand what you're saying, but um, no, I <laughs> no nothing, no nothing, nothing. I just used to no, not I didn't put any advertising on it. I never made any. No, no, it wasn't about you making money. It's about them making money, and if it was going to cost them more than oh, than oh it was worth no, to keep you I going. just <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, it's like a hundred dollars a year to pay. Yeah. My, Whatever, but they, but it just, it was weird the way they did it was that they, they told me take this picture down. So I did. And Mm -hmm. then they sent me another, like, take this picture down. And, and they said, like, we don't think you should have to take this down. So I didn't. I I took the first picture down. And then I thought they were just going to make me take the picture down. It was just, I'm just saying the Sandy Hook thing seemed to me to be a litmus test that they threw out there. And that's actually what I was saying. I was like, this weird picture is making the rounds in the world Mm -hmm. as a different person from who we all know he is. So it's no opposer and they're calling him something else. And why? Like, this is weird. And I think that that picture was the litmus test Hmm. that flagged people who were paying attention. Oh, I I, I don't don't disagree. Um, I guess what I was saying was just, you know, the, the, most of the population in the world ta- takes Alex Jones to mean nothing he said could possibly have been true. Even though Alex Jones right. was probably vindicated in many ways in some of the stuff he yeah. said, like yeah, fair amount of it. But they, you know, there's the whole poison the well sort of thing. And you do yes. walk a line where you, like, I don't think I, you've not, like you said, you've never presented anything knowingly uh, not truthful. But you, there's a line that you walk. Where I think most people, ah, no, that's that's all insane. She, she's just, you know, whatever, one of those crazy people. I know, peoples. but and but. and that does put you in a a, a solid place. Um, I think like with the Sandy Hook thing, that's a, a moment where you, Kid Icarus, flew a little too close to the sun, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the Boston Marathon bombing, I really did a lot of research. I mean, I was on their radar for that thing. Hmm. There, they uh, had. And Miriam Carey was another one, but they, there was that Todeshev, the guy who got killed in Florida. Do you remember that? Was marathon bombing guy's friend in Florida got shot like six times in the head by FBI agents in his own apartment. I, I don't remember it happening, but I would yeah. have been, I would well, have been less into politics at that point in time too. It didn't get that much press, but, but I was so all over it. I actually got a call from supposedly his wife or whatever from Russia. And I know it was Russia because I had to like make the connection on my radio show, hmm. like uh, in my radio studio to record the conversation I was going to have with her. But I, I mean, for them to have found me, 
I must have been making a first hand contribution. And yeah. with Sandy Hook, by then I just didn't even try anymore because I was like, okay, the scales have felt from my eyes with the Boston Marathon bombing thing. People freak out. And I could spend all night, every night, trying, like I did with the Boston Marathon bombing, finding all the mistakes and all the mainstream media, all the inconsistencies, all the lies, and try to prove it. But I just don't, but I don't want to spend that kind of time. Anyone who wants to figure that stuff out can until February 14th, 2018. And then it became a lot harder. But, you know, I don't, I don't get into all that stuff anymore because you either you do it yourself, you know, do it yourself, figure it out and then come back. To me. Well, and, and, and I maybe I know with me personally, being a parent and having, you know, a kid has definitely affected the ways in which I'm willing to perhaps engage politically um we our podcast we host is primarily kind of pop culture music driven a slash hey we're kooky parents sure <laughs> yeah yeah be yeah good part of that is because at a certain point like i don't need random cps call-ins you know to try and take yeah. my kid away from me because i'm looking the wrong thing up on the internet um, yeah, and what are you really gonna do? What are you really gonna? Well, there's nothing you can. There's nothing. <laughs> like um, nothing. I I agree. We, I, I don't even know why I keep doing. You know, I just don't even know why. It's a compulsion. I don't know we have. why. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I recently just finished a product a project with some friends. Uh, it was the Freedom Song Three Six Five project, which is open to the public now, folks. If you're out there listening, um, and we we every year for every day for a year we did a write-up on a different song with, like, a libertarian or anarchist theme. And some nights I'm down here in the basement, like, writing my take on these songs, and I'm just waiting for someone to crash through the door and black bag <laughs> me, and, you know? <laughs> and it's like, <sighs> I I tweeted something yesterday that, that made me feel like that. Like, uh, I tweeted if it was this thing about the Iranian general getting killed, and the headline was, we bombed an airport in Baghdad and killed these seven people in the plane. Targeted assassination, it looked like. And I just tweeted, this would be terrorism if they did it to us. Like, yeah. they would call it terrorism. And I started getting nervous because people were reacting to it. Like, I got a lot of likes, but then I got, like, all these people come out of the woodwork. Like you said, like, I don't know if they're real or not, but how many American citizens are really fired up for war for well no if you're going by anyone reason. if you're going by anyone's facebook page i know plenty lots and lots I know. of them I, on yeah, both the and left were, and the right and it's like who are these people well the left thing that was quite a coup that they got the left to think that trump was in bed with russia so that kind of demanding that he start a war that ultimately will lead to russia to prove they, they were all clamored when he was pulling out of Syria. They were like, oh, sure, appease the Russians. Appease the Russians, Trump. And it's like, are you seriously saying that we should continue interventions and war because you don't like this guy's haircut? I mean, it's just well, the, it's stupid. The, the whole thing, like, I, I, I've i never, like, I've always been an anti-war person. Like, I, I, Despite what a lot of people felt on 9-11, my very specific feelings were, oh, it sucks for all those people that died, but this doesn't seem all that odd to me. I mean, if you meddle in the fucking Middle East long enough, eventually yeah. you're, you're going to bring the shit home to you. And that's all it was. Yeah, <laughs> yes. My response was, oh, we've got to solve this now. We have to stop. I thought everyone would say we have to stop. <laughs> like, I didn't, couldn't believe it that they were just like. Next thing you know, whoa, let's go and double down. Right. Like, I was like, what? I said, rebuild the Twin Towers and just get out of the Middle East. I'm like, that is not what and, happened. And to be clear, I was a 17-year-old kid when that happened. And and while I'm watching all of my friends sign up for the military, I'm like, you're all fucking yeah, stupid. Right. Why would you go do this? I, I but, watched... see that's part of the thing. They take the best people. They take the courageous people. The people. If you do, you ever read the report from Iron Mountain? I've mentioned it a thousand times. I uh, right? know it's from the '60s. It's really short. You could just get it on PDF. It was a, a total bestseller. It was supposedly true. Some people say it was basically true. Some people say it was totally true. And they talk about their methods of controlling people. And one of the things they say is that you have to you have a euphemized this is what it called a euphemized form of slavery hmm. so then after that you got like slave to debt slave to drugs they talked about warehousing young people and then you had like 
college, everybody all of a sudden had to go to college or got signed up for the draft. They said um, you have to demonize a despised minority so Sorry. that. Are you just are you just reading a bunch of dead Kennedy's lyrics at me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But that's what it said. I'm just saying that's what it said. And they and perhaps they uh, literally everything you're saying is just like what. Oh, wait. Every one of their songs was about. It's just this is like literally the song titles you're naming off at me there. <laughs> well, that's funny because the report from Iron Mountain was a report to JFK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my guess is they read it. Probably not a mistake there. I was actually just you no, know, you're not a big uh, podcast listener because you have kids and you're a good parent. Um, I was just <laughs> listening to John McAfee on uh, Andrew Heaton's political orphanage yesterday. And man, listening to John McAfee talk about shit, like I'm never entirely sure how on the level that guy is. Yeah, is he for real or not? Like I don't- (laughs) His entire thing was just him laying out like what the CIA is doing and like how long it's been doing it and how it works because- because his th- angle is he's, he was a big wig in the you know uh, cybersecurity oh, world forever, yeah, yeah. and he's like I used to be in all these CIA meetings. Oh, really? And, and and he's like he's talking to Heaton about us, and you're just like I I never know what to believe what he says. Like is he is he limited hangout? Like what what is it? Well, I, but still, just listen. But what, what get I what was, you can. But what he, he was actually saying yesterday is like it's like well the thing is is that a lot of these people that you'll find in these places they're true patriots. They genuinely believe that what they're doing is the right thing. Like I totally do- believe that. Yeah, and it's totally. like, like no, what they're doing isn't what you or I would want them to do. But they believe that this is the best thing that they can do for the country. And the best thing that they can do for the country is keep the country from meddling in its affairs. Like, keep it to only the yeah. people that need to know. He's like, the minute they invented need to know. Right. That's what I was going to say. Secrecy. That's the thing that they have to. Well, and, come and it's to terms the left with. hand doesn't have to know what the right hand's doing in that. Right. And it keeps it, secrets can be kept a lot easier when not everyone has to know. So you only need ten people to know this part of the project, and then these other ten people know this part of the project, and they never have to know what the whole project is. And it's it was a it, yeah. <laughs> the way I think about it is that once you started that ball rolling, and they did the OSS and the CIA and all that. And they created this world where it seemed to operate that way, or it did. It reminds me of a line from The Mission, the movie The Mission, where the there's a cardinal talking to a priest and they're getting their marching orders about, I don't know, taking over the missions of Paraguay or something like that. And the priest says to the, the cardinal's feeling a little guilty about all the natives he's about to kill. And the priest says, well, your eminence, the world is thus. And the cardinal says... Thus have we made the world. Mm. So I think the guys who are saying, well, the world is thus, you're an idiot, you're a fool. Like that, that's when they see Obama going in there and, and dropping 20,000 bombs a year on Syria. The conservatives will say, or the neoconservatives will say, well, he saw what it's really like. This always happens. And they'll say the same thing about Trump. He said he didn't want war and he was sincere, but then he got in there and he saw what it was really like. But I would say, and I guess maybe it's too late now, but I would say if you went back and looked at who did make the world thus? I mean, Prescott Bush pops into my mind. You know, people back then, yeah. even before World War II, and maybe before World War, definitely before well, World War One, when they were they were doing it. They the British wanted to get rid of any potential alliance between Germany and Russia. What was really interesting about McAfee's, like what he was getting at, is that he he had a, a bit of a hope about him because in the way that he like sees this, he's like. The fact of the matter is, is that there's a hope that if the American people could ever get their goddamn senses about them and tell the government to do the right thing, a lot of those people that run those those things would do it because, you know, they they respect the system. Um, I don't know how much of that I, as an ANCAP, personally agree with. I think the system in and of itself is designed to do certain things. But it, it was interesting to see somebody approach it from that angle that, you know, Yes, it's fucked up and it's doing all these things, but if you can actually get enough of a mass of people to fight back on it, you can put it back where it needs to be, which is why I always question limited hangout. <laughs> well, it go- I don't know. I think it goes a little far. I- I'm very interested in him. He's always fascinated me in that way, and some stuff doesn't make sense, so I don't know what he's up to. Maybe he pulls his punches. Look, for any man security. that's smart enough to marry know. a prostitute, I'm... I'm 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 down. Yeah, with him. he is fascinating. Yeah, you know, I you, mean, you pay for the skills that you want out of somebody, right? <laughs> it's interesting, go. and maybe she has real life experience that he finds interesting. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but I'm I'm going to remind people: 
that the the real missed opportunity of the 2016 election is John McAfee versus Trump mm. because you just see Trump up there looking at John McAfee and he goes, your wife's a whore. And McAfee goes, I know, <laughs> that's what I pay her for. <laughs> And, and perfect. It's a win win. I want just the, the, the missed opportunity of seeing that on stage. It, it hurts me. There you go. Well, I would have loved to see McAfee and he could solve so many problems. Really, he could. But the, or but the blow the whole thing up like, either way. Reese, yeah. Like the encryption thing, like he could make like he fix viruses without the, the way they're trying to say, well, we, we have to be able to hack into somebody's phone if they're a terrorist. Yeah. And because of that, we need a backdoor and everything. And there's nothing you can do. He he's he's offered solutions to that problem well so, I mean, that was his big thing when he was running he's like i just want to talk about cybersecurity and how every yeah. other nation's doing it better than we are yeah i mean yeah. if we could take that away as a lever of fear and power it would set them back a bit but i feel like if you wanted to just reset the clock like you're saying he said that there's just so much water under the bridge i mean how is somebody like putin gonna trust you to for the reset how do you you'd have to really dismantle the power in order to ensure that nobody was going to come and slide in and take it back hmm. i like i said i'm an ancap i think having any of it all is a bad yeah. idea so yeah but it was it was, seat, seat. it was interesting listening to somebody especially somebody with that background that he has talk about it in the way they were um i guess gonna listen to that the uh thank you for break off these paper chains wake up a free man Like I said, that I, I'm personally really interested in is, is how in the world do you manage to juggle what you do with being a parent, especially a parent with a special needs Dude. child? Like that, as a parent myself, and knowing all the things that I do and how to make life work is very difficult. And it really fascinates me that with your, um, you know, within our, the, our, the community we're a part of, the level of notoriety you've reached. Like, how is that with being a parent? <laughs> it's it's all a little crazy. The biggest thing is that now that I started doing a daily podcast with Finkley, my producer from the radio show, which is just on the weekends, we do a daily podcast. And boy, is that a time sink. So that's a big problem. The first thing to go was like me walking the dogs, which is bad for everybody. Aww. I got to figure <laughs> out how to get that back. I have to just for my own sanity. Although sometimes I feel good about not having like aluminum rain down on my head every day. I just look up and I see the lines in the sky. I'm like, I can't. It's depressing. Oh. But yeah, but I do. I actually kind of tell my kids, don't. First of all, a lot of people think I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, like people think I'm not serious. Like even when I first got this job, I, I was wasn't looking for it. I wanted to go back into banking and or whatever. And uh or be a mom for a while, then just have some options open at the end. And one thing led to another. And when I was telling them this a radio producer, I met, introduced me to her boss, the program director at WSB. And they were like laughing when I was telling them, I was just like, no, I, you people, there was a time when no one questioned the existence of God. And, and you just can't even get your mind around that yet. Nobody I've ever met like in the real world, has questioned the necessity of government. And they're just like, you're crazy. I'm like, no, I'm serious. Like, that's what makes it great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there, so I feel like if people, a lot of people ask me a di kind of a different question for you. You're like, are you for reals? People ask me if I believe what I'm saying. I'm like, I believe more than what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I try to. I'm being I guarded because I'm not a lunatic. I, yeah, because you you guys will s scream and yell at me, which happens a lot. Like they, uh, it's better now because I'm like better at it, but it used to happen a lot. So I was always like nervous about that. So I try to tell my kids to never 
ever talk about me, never ever like refer to me having a radio show. Like just don't encourage people to listen to it. And don't talk to police. Don't talk yeah, to like it. try not to try try. I, I even like it's it did get a little like I started getting nervous that I was really giving the kids too much reality. Like this facade that we see around us of like the two party system and all that kind of thing. I think you kind of need a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you can't be, I don't think you need the lie, but the fact that everyone is functioning within that lie, you cannot send a 12 year old to school who's, although, you know, Atlanta is, it, it can be a little friendlier to that. I remember I did when my son was in second grade, I sent him, I don't know what the project was supposed to be about. I can't remember, but somehow I sent him in there and I said, look, Tell them about the gold standard. Take the price of milk in 1800, the price of milk in 1900, and the price of milk in 2000. And in 1800, it was like a dime. In mm. 1900, it was a dime. And in 2000, it was $5. Wow. It's like, that's, yeah. that's the Fed. And the teacher... Well, the easy, you, you see, the easy fix to that is, why are you not unschooling your child? <laughs> well, I know. Well, oh, I'll tell God. you, that's where the Downs kid comes in. He was my first son, my first child. And uh, it just, it's I, I love him to death. I'm happy to have him. But I mean, we, once my little one built this, the coolest Lego I ever saw, it was like a Chinese temple with a big dragon on top of it. And my son with Down syndrome just got away from us and he went in with a pillow and he just mm. broke it into a thousand pieces the day it was finished. And I mean, that like, so you, my daughter could never have a dollhouse. Like kids with Down syndrome can be like little maniacs. They're like puppies mm -hmm. with thumbs. You know, you just, oh. they just run around wrecking stuff and running away. And you just don't, it, it like changed my whole expectation of how my kids would never eat sugar. And it's like, no, 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 no. Here, have a lollipop, watch some Dora. I got to run after this kid. Yeah. So it got, if that's a little, he's better now. It's like, we're fine, but it, just changed my priorities and maybe maybe that's good mm -hmm. well I, I know with art with Ar Irma like I, I've been I've gone the opposite direction I've been very very transparent about things I'm never going to teach my kid to, to respect law enforcement despite the fact that her uncle is law enforcement um, you know but for me a lot of it is it's important to me to teach her you know context and things like I've never taught my kid not to swear just when not to swear like that that's, that's good a, that's that a more is super key it's yeah. a more important thing like speak however you want to speak but know that these right. are going to be the effects in certain positions yeah. and in that same vein like this is what mommy and daddy believe but you need to know that this is not what most people believe right. so you know and a lot of and that and you get to believe what you want but just be honest with yourself yes yeah and you know? i like that her uncle that's so interesting to me like it, i think that's an opportunity to teach the difference between an individual and an institution and like what you were talking about before how they were what mcafee was saying that they're they are true believers they believe it well, and I, that, I i joke with people my my little brother is probably one of the more liberty minded people i know but like you know not not liberty like I believe. Yeah, and and you but you can approach then you can approach the individual with yeah. love, mm -hmm. and then you don't really play their game because they, what they want is for us to hate each other. They want us to pick sides. Absolutely. And I feel like if you can just remove yourself from the, them from that framing, you've you've really maybe won the battle because what difference does it make anyway? If this if this is all there is. I'm not sure it's worth worrying that much. Well, about. And I think I think the reason we started approaching is because we have to we have to deal with the the big one between me and mom, and that mom is a is a Christian and I'm an atheist. Right. So so everything is about balance. And yeah, everything is individual. This is what somebody you know, believes, believes, and <laughs> you can figure it out on your own. Right. And here's the context. Yeah, that's interesting, and that is that that is the I, I actually think if there is a point. If there is a point, maybe the point is, is that journey is just how do you, like, that's why if there's a God, he would not just write you like a welcome to the world, love God. Yeah. This is about the, is about finding those answers for yourself, whatever they are. Well, I've always, in the relation to God, I've always lived by the Stephen Fry. I mean, if any, if, if, if me being a good person isn't enough for God, well, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna do. Yeah, I do I, I do, do. I do 
uh, I actually feel like, and I try to teach my kids this, like real, and and I'm a practicing Catholic, although I was I a raised Catholic. Yeah, I struggle. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I do what my mother says. She's like, it's just the better way to live. Yeah. So as a per a relationship with personal relationship with God, the expectation that I'm going to die and somebody's still going to be calling me by my name and I'm going to hear that name. I can't get my mind around that, but I do. There is a Catholic tenet, which is the tenet I live by and teach my kids. Like be honest with yourself, inform your conscience and follow your conscience. So if you think you're wrong, if you think that something everybody's doing is wrong, if you think not using birth control is wrong and you, and you don't use it because the church tells you not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like even if it's the opposite of what the church is teaching you, you're still doing something wrong with yourself. Yeah. You have to, God gave you, let's say reason, the understanding, ability to discern right from wrong and free will. Like you have to believe that. Well, that's kind of. Always essence been. of humanity anyway right yeah. for me that was always the stick where like look god didn't give me a brain to ignore what it's telling me yeah and that was so different yeah. from what i kind of grew up in and then sort of learned to go with that like does this ring true with me and like feel so much better about it than i ever did just kind of doing well this person's in authority so i guess i do what they say you know yeah me too yeah i was i was not a practicing catholic for uh, many, many, many years. And, and we had a tragedy in my family. I had kids, like you said, it like changes your world. And I just said, you know what? I, I need to put my family into this kind of structure, but I didn't abandon my ability to think and the, and the sense of personal responsibility. And that's what my mother's like, what are you so worried about the world? God is up in his heaven. I was like, God did not give us yeah. this you know, we're not here for nothing. If you're, you know, living in a cloister isn't really going to, I, that can't be the point. Maybe it is the point for some people, but it's not. Yeah. I keep getting directed into doing what I'm doing. Like I said, like, I don't even really know why, but like it keeps going that way. So I feel like I've maybe. I think my true issues with Catholicism are just that I grew up in the world at an age where I was literally in my early twenties seeing how bad the priests raping young boys thing had been. <laughs> Well, my parents always You're taught like, me that the that the church had gone bad. So that's the thing. In the mm-hmm. '60s, my parents were, were saying the church has been infiltrated by people who don't believe in God or the church, or whatever. So, like they, my parents, people would say to them, "How could you stay in the church?" Like we've been trying to tell you, yeah, that that the church is messed up. Like, but so the church all is the people; it's people. not the priests. Y- yeah. More or less, yeah. It's, uh, but they were saying that pre- the priests are not the church. The people are the church. And it all, co- like, I was I was really into yoga for a while. And I read the yoga sutras and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, wow, this is my mom. Mm-hmm. She just sits there in the practice. And that's it. Like, that's that. And then I realized, mm-hmm. like, it doesn't, it, it can converge. But these different practices and even just uh, it, 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 listening to your own conscience, whether you think there's, like, another extra dimensional being or something doesn't matter. It's that you have to listen to that. And then, then we probably would all end up in the same place. Yeah. See, and that's, maybe, that's yeah. a, an interesting thing because like when you're, you're talking about that, that like I, I was deep into, uh, you know, Buddhism and all that stuff after I got out of Catholicism. <laughs> and a lot of reason I left was I started getting into Joseph Campbell's comparative religion. And you need to start looking historically like how much of this is all the same shit from one religion to the next. All the stories are the same and, you know, what they actually mean. And, like, it all seems more like this is something that's structured in our brains physically more than it is what, you know, some type something handed down by God. Um, but maybe that and that's is. What, and that's what took me to kind of open myself up, like, I'm just going to be a good person. That's the, the core tenet of what I need to do. I, I, it's kind of what pulled me away from Catholicism <laughs> as opposed to, yeah, oh. the only, I think the danger is when you are absolutely convinced that there is no ultimate justice mm-hmm. and you use that to be a selfish douchebag that takes everything, will hurt people, kill people, as long as you can get away with it. Like yeah. that's the problem with that, that I fear that it's, not that I teach my kids to be fearful of retribution. I just right. am like, I'm not, that's not, I don't care what your story is. That's not okay. If you take like, away government, that doesn't last as a state you can manage very long, just to be clear. But I feel like it what? all feeds into like kind of a greater mystery that we're, we're all trying to sort of get to. And I think the conscience is part of that. And some of the practices can 
lead you there, but it's all, you know, it's all something we can't completely touch. And like, I, I'm kind of exploring that way now, but um, yeah, I, I, I just feel but like But I think it's the answer bigger. is self-evident in that, and this I got from yoga, from the writings, is that you, the answer is the same. So the question of whether there's a God or not is unanswerable. And the, and the answer to how to live is the same. It's, a, it's an irrelevant question because mm-hmm. the pursuit of the self is unfulfilling. So however you, you make your pursuit, if it's just trying to fulfill your ego, your appetites or whatever, it, you're, it's just going to open up larger and larger cravings. I mean, you can see that with drug addicts. I come from a big family of drug addicts. <laughs> they just, just keep pouring the heroin in. Yeah, yeah their Jones it. just gets like puts bigger dollar signs on it. I'm like, you're still not happier than I am. You, <laughs> you know, like you're this never, is not better. You're never gonna hit that first high, but you know, whatever. Never you keep doing it. Well, I mean, and that truth is repeated in so many things. You know, people go through that, you know, with their practices or or with success or with you know life experiences, like trying to find that bigger high. Yeah, and I and I feel like that. Now, I'm not saying it's not ego driven also, but I look at, okay, maybe I have this gift. Maybe I was, I'm supposed to talk to people about this stuff, or maybe I'm supposed to raise this child as an example that, that people with down syndrome have value, like whatever. And maybe my desire to fulfill what I think are my talents say, or whatever my, my calling, I don't know what, maybe that is, maybe that's that, that's ego satisfying. And maybe that's why we have an ego, you know, but I just, I feel like if you are honest with yourself about, about what would be satisfying to you, you would, I think it's goodness. So it doesn't matter to me what the, what the interdimensional being looks like. Yeah. I feel like there's some sort of, sort of magic that happens there because there's, there's so many moments where people are totally just doing that thing that lights them up and it lights other people up. And like, there is something transcendent, for lack of a better word, in that. And you're liberated from materialism. Yeah. Which is what they've got you by a stranglehold is that you're so freaking worried about materialism, material things and or whatever, status, comfort. I don't know. Yeah. But you can. I think that's why I, don't, I like to reframe. I don't like to accept the frameworks. It's kind of like getting a blowjob feels great, but... <laughs> Allowing a woman to have an orgasm is infinitely more rewarding. It's Dude, good for the don't ego. Don't even start with that. It's <laughs> such a great system. Everybody comes at once. Nobody has any has to. It's no effort. It's no chore. You don't have to beg somebody to do. It. It's like, hey man, let's fuck. We could do it by commercial. Yeah, just do it in a commercial. Everybody wins. <laughs> I don't even get the other thing. Yeah. yeah. All right. As is pure, pure <laughs> Monica fashion, she has managed to talk and get us so deep in the hole that there's no way of getting out of the hole without another two hours worth of conversation. Unfortunately, I'm not talking about the hole. <laughs> oh God. And I have done what Nick does, which is completely make it ridiculous because that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you so much for the conversation, Monica. Anytime you want to come on and and shoot the shit and be weird, we would love it. Yeah. Uh, any My any pleasure. last any last minute things you'd like to say? Well, I'm not sure that was the note I expected to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to do it again. I'll redeem myself. Awesome. <laughs> no, you you were you were, you were wonderful. It was it was exactly the conversation I imagined having. I just you you you're such a wealth of knowledge, and you go so deep into things <laughs> that it's like. You know, there it, it really is it possible to have a shorter than two hour conversation with Monica based on all my friends uh, podcasts. It does not seem so. And that's and, OK. And when you get to the middle of this one, the end of this one, you're gonna be like, that feels like that should have went on for another hour. <laughs> and it will be proof that that apparently it's a two hour conversation minimum. There you go. Well, you can tease it till <laughs> next time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, where do you want people to head if they listen and go search for you if they don't already yeah, just know you? <laughs> go to the prop report.com, the like propaganda report, the prop report.com. I put my WSB terrestrial radio shows on there and my deep dive with my partner in podcasting, Binkley, that's the propaganda report. And then we do a daily show, the drive time news last 30 minutes every day. We can hear the news without all the bullshit. And awesome. it is a highlight of my day every day. 
Liz looks over me quizzically as I listen to it in the evenings after work going, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm like, <laughs> you have to have a cocktail while you're listening to oh, it. Okay, you're not that's doing the it problem. right. There we go. Now I know. Well, no, she comes in 15 minutes into well, it. Well, yeah, I just walk into stuff. <laughs> when all of it is like, all of the exposition is gone. It's like, I think Edward Snowden's a cross-dresser. I was like, what? Wait, where did this come from? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> he was. He, I don't think he's pretty enough to be a cross dresser, personally. No, and, I. And as a Julia Assange non- was actually a drag queen. That's where it all came. From. Well, there you go. Well, in in fairness, I'd probably give Julian Assange a spin before Horst Snowden. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there so. you go. This is how you get a second hour, Nick. So right, right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Monica. You have yourself a good day. You too. Bye, guys. Bye. I said, go, go, go. Go live your whole thing mm. So, I'm just saying, I had a lot of fun there. Making it just so weird. Yeah, that's kind of my MO. That's why, I'm, that's why I really like putting freaks in the title. I know, you know. That's, I, I'm okay with it. I, I, I like your freaky side. I like I my hope, freaky side, too. I hope too. everybody else can just roll with it or ignore it. Either way, <laughs> we like you hanging with us. Look, the freaks come out at night. I take that shit seriously. <laughs> if, like, if you're not listening to this show, like, in the middle of the night, yeah. I don't know what you're doing with your life. You're doing it wrong. Oh. In fact, you know, you should probably listen to this while fornicating. You know. I don't know what that'll do for the experience. I don't know about all that. Maybe it'll make it feel more like an orgy, like where people are having conversations and no, stuff around you. I feel you. like that would be distracting. You feel like that's distracting? Yeah. You've been to a lot of orgies, Liz? No. But. See, the I way feel like the having way music in the background that. that is too involved is distracting, so. Look, the way you just said that, I am now going to have to question some things. I don't think you should. I mean, Folks, we've known each other for a while. why don't you like contact us and why don't we why don't you vote as to whether or not you think she's full of shit and she's lying to me about whether or not she's been in an orgy because you know the way she said that just kind of i mean you know i am i'm down with whatever interaction you guys you guys want to have you guys want to vote on that you go right ahead i really think that you should rethink what you just said no because i'm here talking about orgies and you're like like i'm i'm really okay with whatever interaction you people want to bring to the table and i'm like honey that's you just basically told your fans to to start like propositioning you online did i Yes. Okay. Well, know. that is not what I meant. I don't do the twitters and the things like like all of the internet peoples. Okay. I just I just meant I. I know what you meant. More interaction with the fans, but it's difficult. But not in a weird, creepy way. I just meant, hey, you know, send us a message on Facebook and I'm be okay. nice. I'm okay. That's with all weird, I meant. Creepy stuff, like you know. <laughs> That's all I meant. Just know that if you start sending her weird shit, like I'm gonna also look at it and be like, oh, you know. It's Pretty nice dick, or you know, that's, I mean, that's a nice pussy, whatever, because that's that's how that'll go. That's how that goes. That is how it goes. Ugh, I don't understand. Look, anytime I get some like r- r- weird random sex stuff sent to me, I would show it to you. I'm like, what do you think, babe? I guess. You know, I don't. I don't tend to get weird random sex stuff. I know, sent but to you me. you literally just said on the I podcast. just asked for nudes. Is that what you said? <laughs> you basically just asked for nudes. On the I am podcast. so sorry. That is not what I want. <laughs> and you know what we're going to follow up talking about nudes on the podcast with? What? People should go and listen to uh, Foreign Policy Focus with uh, Kyle Anzalone. Oh, good God. Thank don't, God for don't, a don't subject ask, change. Don't ask Kyle for nudes. Please don't. What, are you got a problem with Kyle? You don't think he's an attractive man? I mean, he's got a good beard. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I don't, does he even have a beard? I don't think so. Maybe not. I think you're thinking of a different Kyle. <laughs> How many Kyles do you know? Are these the Kyles that were at the orgy list? There's too many Kyles. <laughs> so, at any rate, folks, Dead. thank you so much for listening to Sounds Like Liberty, and I hope that you will all be here next week when we officially change over to Peace Freaks. Yes. Not much is changing. We're still going to be the same. I don't know. I feel like you're couple. getting a little more freaky over there. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like that happened during the show, so like there's been a continuum. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm, fair enough. I'm just I'm feeling like you know I'm gonna be me. I'm not gonna not gonna well that is the me. That is something I'm about. I I go out and do that that good thing that you 
you are the only person that does that. And Sling some good people dick. could argue that being some brand of freaky is a good thing. So you 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 do you, baby. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say we're going to be a Christian conservative podcast anytime soon, like part of the problem. But, uh, you know, maybe we'll pick up those disgruntled lefties. I mean, but he's, you know, he's doing his thing. He He's really passionate about that. I'm okay with it. <laughs> Became Christian and it came became weird. I love Dave. I think he's awesome. I I'm I like Dave. You know mm-hmm. he's very Jewy and mm-hmm. principled. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he waffles around on the uh, the borders thing too much. I thought he was the most consistent motherfucker we know. No, because this is libertarian land where I'm the most consistent motherfucker I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Look, he he waffles on borders, honey. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know border, anything about that. Border thing's a big issue with me. Gonna be honest, but okay. And I'm sure most people who listen regularly know where I fall on borders, and I'm not uh, not afraid of it. But I'm not gonna tell you right now, because mm-hmm. that would just be I don't know what's the word it would be. It'd be something. Okay. Let's go out on some ambiguity. Sure. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next Wednesday.